A good portion of the book details the immense and rich socio-political history of the Central African Republic, its many coups, its long list of die-hard leaders, and the ever-changing political climate. Although daunting at first, this vast history helps the reader understand the turmoil and general unease faced by the population of Bangui in the run-up to the Battle of Bangui and how South African troops should never have been there in the first place. Sending the SANDF to the Central African Republic as unofficial and unrecognized peacekeepers resulted in the loss of 13 soldiers, humiliation for South Africa, and raised questions about why South Africa chose to seemingly prop up a coup leader for highly questionable reasons. Nonetheless, facing poor odds, their training and bravery ultimately meant that the situation was handled as best it could. Orders were broadly followed, and an even greater loss of South African lives was averted. The book continually alludes that although South Africans were generally welcome in the Central African Republic, the introduction of the SANDF was a point of contention from the very outset. Good morning, James, and thank you for taking the time out to talk to us about the Battle of Bangui. Can you start off by giving us a brief overview of how the book came about? So the book came about, you know, in 2013. Um, so myself and Stefan Hofstadter, at the time, we both worked for the Sunday Times. And we got sent there in the, in the, the days after the battle had happened. So that was back in 2013. Um, and then, you know, we, we subsequently went back again in 2014, um, which was that we, we actually went back one year after the battle and the situation there had really um, degenerated. It was a terrible um, situation. There was ethnic cleansing going on and that kind of thing. So, um, and then it was after that that we got access to some of the um, the SANDF, um, you know, soldiers that fought in the battle. Uh, and then we kind of like sat on it, you know, life gets in the way. And then, uh, you know, we always wanted to do the book, but, you know, we got caught up with other projects and so on. And then uh, in the meantime, uh, a few years later, uh, Warren Thompson uh, came on the scene and he'd actually been conducting his own research. Um, you know, he'd become interested in, in, in the CAR after doing an investigation on some diamonds that had turned up in Antwerp. And he figured that these diamonds might have something to do with, um, you know, the South African soldiers that were, were killed there. So he started conducting his own information. And then during that course, you know, um, you know we, we actually met each other and we decided that, um, you know, the best way forward is by, you know, putting all our material together and focusing, you know, on, on building this book together. And that's actually how the book came about. And then we actually all managed to go there together last year, uh, just before the lockdown, actually. So we were able to then consolidate and speak to new people and, and get some really cool information. What were your preconceptions of being a South African journalist heading off to Bangui, hot on the heels of a military being overrun and the subject of a very fresh and humiliating surrender to rebel forces? You know, prior to going to Central African Republic, the first time in 2013, just after the battle, I didn't know much about it. Um, you know, I, I, I had read some reports here and there, um, but, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd visited places like the Congo, um, the DRC before, um, which is, you know, very, it's very close neighbor. But I had no idea what to expect there. I was very nervous because I knew that the rebels were in charge. And, yeah, and... Um, you know, myself and Stefan, who, who visited there, you know, together the first time, we, we sort of made a plan to not tell anyone that, that we were South African unless they, unless they ask. <laughs> so, um, you know, but, but um, ultimately, you know, it was, it was right of us to be nervous. Uh, we were very cautious. Um, so we, were, we didn't take anything lightly. Um, safety was, was a, um, you know, very... It was a big priority for us, so we, we didn't rush any, in, into any situation foolishly. We took our time and we made sure that we had, um, you know, people that could assist. So, for example, we hired a, a translator uh, called Vincent, um, and he was brilliant because he was a, a former school teacher. And he was, he was a, quite a, a, senior, a senior guy, so he was probably uh, in his 60s. And... 
You know, there was one instance, for example, when we went to, to meet some, some rebels and it, there was, they were very tense when they saw us there. And it was very, I thought, oh no, we, something bad is going to happen here. And then suddenly one of them actually recognized our translator, Vincent. And, and they looked at each other and they kind of smiled and then they greeted each other very warmly. And it turns out that Vincent had been that rebel school teacher when he was a kid in school. <laughs> so that was, that was amazing for us. So then suddenly the, the mood changed uh, and then the, the rebels kind of, you know, they, they went from being very threatening to being more curious um, and it kind of broke the ice in, in a way. But yeah, to answer your question, it was very nerve wracking. What were your first impressions of the situation and country having landed at the Bangui airport? Safety was a big precaution for us. And, you know, we had taken the or made the effort. Uh, and I suppose we had a bit of luck as well that we had an associate that knew someone in, in Bangui. And this guy turned out to be quite a senior figure. And he, he, he knew quite a few of the rebels. Um, his name was Igor. And Igor actually met us at the airport and which was that he was like a, a godsend for us because the airport itself um, is a very scary place because you kind of, you come off the plane and, and you walk out with your bags and there's often a lot of um, chaos outside uh, people trying to, you know, taxi drivers and money changers and all that kind of thing. And if, if you, if you don't know what you doing you know you can be quite it can be quite intimidating you know all all these people are like rushing towards you and stuff and especially in the context of you know um, this coup that had just happened so Igor met us there and and he took us through all of that um, and then he took us straight to the ledger hotel which will became it had become a, a de facto headquarters of the of the rebel army so he took us straight there and and, and we were luckily we were able to get a room there. We just shared a room because, um, you know, it was quite a fancy hotel. And you know, Sunday Times journalists from South Africa, we don't really have euros to to burn, yeah. so we shared a room, um, and uh, it was it worked out very well. But uh, yeah, I, th I think the, the the population of of um, Bangui, you know, they've you know they've seen um foreign military coming in for years you know for, for more than 50 years uh, even longer you know it was a former french colony so they they view i mean they they view foreigners especially white people white foreigners with a, a bit of cynicism because because of the history um you know they've been exploited and they've been abused by um co colonization uh, and and even after colonization by just shady dealings and, and things like that. So people are generally wary of, of outsiders there. I can imagine that speaking to and taking the photographs of Seleka rebels and their leaders was a scary prospect. Tell us more about how these first encounters went and what was running through your mind at the time. So the, whole, the whole thing, we were like kind of the first few days, especially we were going around, we were very nervous. <laughs> um, so uh, we didn't really know where to start. Um, you know, luckily we had had Igor there to, to help us as the camera helped to break the, break the ice. Uh, and, and that in some, in some situations it does, um, but in others not. So it's just a case by case situation. And, you know, when, when we would approach um, rebels, it would always be with, um, you know, with caution. Um, we'd have, we had a little pieces of paper with our accreditation details and that, that, you know, we'd have to show this, this paper uh, everywhere we went. Um, there'd always be checkpoints al along the roads, you know, many checkpoints and all manned by rebels. And each one of them would demand to see our papers. They would take it off, get it stamped. But then once we would, you know, meet the rebels, we'd obviously ask to speak to the commanding officer. And, you know, once the commanding officer gave us an audience, um, and we explained what we were doing, then it actually went quite well. And then there was, you know, the, you know, like I said to you earlier, we didn't want to announce that we were South African, but then they did ask. They asked, are you South African? And we were like, yes, we are. And we didn't know how they were going to react to that. But, you know, surprisingly enough, they, they reacted quite well. And, and, and this is where we first started getting a, a, an idea of, 
you know, the bravery of our men because these rebel leaders who, who just fought our guys, one of the first things that they said to us, you know, on several occasions was, your guys fought really well. You know, you, you guys, you know, they, they did so much damage to us. Um, and, and they kept saying, your guys fought bravely, your guys fought well. And that's when we first started to realize, hmm, maybe there's more, there's more of a story here than just the one that, that we think we know. The book also conveys a sense of being left behind and forgotten by senior SANDF officers back in Pretoria. What was the general mood conveyed by the soldiers you interviewed and interacted with post-battle and back in South Africa? There was two kind of like two distinct distinctive attitudes with the, the South African soldiers, and one was they were angry. Um, you know, they felt that you know they could have won. Um, if they'd been given the right uh, equipment, you know, Roy Falk helicopters, for example, if, um, you know, if, if, if one or two of them had been deployed, you know, they really could have, you know, driven the rebels back and, and possibly changed the outcome. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there were no um, helicopters deployed. So, um, you know, after the battle, there were some Roy Falk helicopters made ready. Um, in the in the Congo, um, but this was sort of too little, too late. And I think, uh, like lots of the soldiers, felt that uh, like this is you know this is unacceptable. Like if you had the stuff, why wasn't it ready before? Because we'd been there several months already. I mean, you know, there was plenty of intelligence um, and that sort of thing. And then um, I think the the other the other you know, the other feeling was that you know why. It was more more angry because um, they weren't sent with the right equipment in the first place. So why did they have these uh, soft-skinned gecko vehicles? Why didn't they have armored APCs? You know, so you know that that, that was the the general mood from the soldiers. One was that they were kind of angry that they didn't get sent there with the right equipment in the first place. So they felt let down um, by their superiors. Um, you know, the, we also spoke to family members of some of the soldiers that had been killed. And, you know, just even this week, um, you know, uh, one of the widows, uh, Kele Bojani, um, she's the widow of uh, Matsumai Bojani, whose uh, nickname was Mr. Fearless. And he actually sacrificed his life so that some of his, um, you know, guys in his unit could get away. Um, and she's, she's livid because, you know, she feels that the, the army haven't given them um, the right sort of explanation. They, they don't know why um, the guys were there in the first place. You know, lots of the family members thought that they were part of a UN peacekeeping uh, deployment, which is incorrect, you know. Um, so they feel like they've been lied to. Um, they, they feel like they, they, their loved ones have been, you know, were lost senselessly and and not for a good reason. And I think that's quite an important thing to, to note um, is the, you know, this, this sort of outrage felt by, by the widows and family members. After they were forced to retreat to the Bangui airport, a SAND of C-130 cargo plane landed carrying critical supplies that could have been used to help the troops sway victory in their favour. However, in a macabre twist of fate, the first pallet of the plane was that of body bags, which would have devastated many demoralized troops, having recently lost 13 of their comrades. How do you think this last knock to morale affected the troops? It was a, a quite a devastating moment. And, um, you know, if, if you read there about uh, Colonel Butibe, who he was the, the, the most senior ranking medical um, staff member, and his story is, is, is harrowing of how they had to go around and collect the bodies and, uh, and as, as you mentioned, so some of the body bags that they had been sent with were of a really low quality. And these bags were splitting open and, you know, the remains were falling out and the bags were leaking and things like that. But he was, he was very concerned, you know, when, as you say, when the doors opened, the first thing he saw was, was body bags because he knew that if the men had to see that, it's going to really, it's going to, uh, take the wind out of out of them and and be very demoralizing. Um, so from from what I understand, he he tried to not not let that many people see it. Um, but yeah, it, it was obviously I think it was it wasn't a very pleasant sight. 
Towards the end of the book, yourself and Stefan came across a seemingly macabre situation in which a foul smell needed to be identified and documented. Tell us more about the situation. At the time, this was days after the battle, um, you know, there were, we didn't really know the, the death toll or, you know, things were very unclear. Uh, we were hearing all sorts of rumors. Uh, some rebels told us that they'd killed up to 36 um, South African soldiers. Um, and while, while we, did, we, we didn't really um, just believe it, you know, as fact, it was in the back of our mind because, you know, you know communications from our government hadn't been, you know, very um, precise up until then. You know, there was a lot of uh, haziness about what had happened. Um, so, as I said, we'd heard these rumors and then we went to, to one of the rebel bases and uh, we were driving sort of up this hill and, you know, we just got hit, you know, in the face by this stench of, of rotting meat. It was just a terrible, terrible smell. And we went to go and investigate and we found these fridges and, uh, you know, some of the soldiers there told us that they had actually killed some South African soldiers. And um, so, yeah, we thought, sure, I mean, what, what is in this, this fridge here? You know, could it be, you know, this macabre discovery, you know? And um, so we, we made ourselves ready. We prepared, you know, for the worst. Uh, we uh, got some rebels to help us break open the thing because the door was sort of jammed. So, um, like they needed to remove some of the bricks and uh, which they did and we were kind of like oh no what are we going to see and um yeah and this rebel finally went in and a cloud of flies came out like more flies than you've ever seen in your life and he came out with this disgusting like bone with meat on it in his hand and just threw it on the ground and then I gingerly put my head in there and, you know, luckily I think I was actually very relieved to, to not see any bodies in there, but it was actually just some, um, some beef that had been <laughs> hung up in there and, and the power had been cut and, and this beef had, had just been rotting there. So we were actually very relieved and, and we, we actually felt a bit foolish as well, you know, so we, we had a bit of a laugh, a bit of a chuckle to ourselves and, we felt a little bit embarrassed, but um, ultimately we were relieved that we didn't find anything more serious in there. This book is uh, it's a very important book because it, it gives us uh, not only a historic background into why Central African Republic is in the situation that it's in today. It's continuously, you know, being exploited and abused, um, you know, by mainly by uh, Western nations. Um, who've been trying to exploit the, the mineral wealth there because obviously they've got diamonds and oil and all this sort of thing, gold. And it's, it's, it's very sad because the population of the Central African Republic, you know, um, the, the situation continues to, you know, be extremely, um, you know, tragic. Uh, like I said, I was there in 2020 and um, it was just before the COVID-19 pandemic broke out and I was actually there to photograph um, children who were ill with measles. So measles is an epidemic that is easily treatable. You know, most of us just get a little uh, shot in our arm, you know, when we're kids and, and, and we don't get measles. But their children are dying of measles, you know, in their thousands every year. Um, even, uh, you know, as recently as last year, I, I visited a, a gold and diamond mining site where I found children as young as five years old uh, actually digging uh, on, 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 on the site. It's unacceptable, really. Things like that make the, the reading the book important because, you know, uh, the battle happened in 2013, but the Central African Republic still continues to suffer for the same reasons um, even today. So I think it's a good African book. It'll give you a good understanding of, of how things work in uh, African countries, how dodgy dealings and how shady businessmen, you know, operate un unethically and how ultimately, you know, the civilians pay the price. That was photojournalist James Oatway speaking to us about the book, Battle of Bangui.